Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the fourth webinar in Educated Child to Keep Children's Learning series. My name is Sabrina Herbie, and I am a Senior Education Specialist with Educated Child, or EAC, and I have the privilege of being your moderator for today's webinar, The Role of Teachers, Redefining How Teaching and Learning Happen in Response to COVID-19 and Beyond. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Educated Child and the Education Above All Foundation, I'll give you a bit of a brief background on who we are and what we do. Educated Child is a global program of the Education Above All Foundation based in Doha, Qatar. We aim to significantly reduce the number of children worldwide who are denied their right to education. EAC at its core is a commitment to children who are out of school to help provide them with the opportunities to learn. EAC works with partner organizations to trigger significant breakthroughs in providing out of school children faced with extreme poverty, cultural barriers, and conflict affected environments an opportunity for a full course of quality primary education. EAC's parent organization, the Education Above All Foundation, is a global foundation founded in 2012 by Her Highness Sheikha Moza bin Nasser, Qatar. It aims to contribute to human, social, and economic development through the provision of quality education with a particular focus on those affected by poverty, conflict, and disaster. Our mission at EAC, or EAA sorry, is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education for vulnerable and marginalized people, especially in the developing world, as an enabler of human development. EAA is proud to work with global, national, regional, and local partners to implement proven and innovative interventions in education, to protect the right to education wherever it is under threat, and to advocate to draw international attention to critical education issues, as well as collaborating with leading global organizations to resolve education-related targets and challenges. Today's webinar, the role of teachers redefining how teaching and learning happen in response to COVID-19 and beyond coincides with World Teachers Day, which was observed on Monday, October 5th, under the theme of teachers learning in crisis, reimagining the future. It is an imperative, or it is rather imperative, that we recognize the ways in which glo the global school closures have impacted teachers and how teachers will be impacted as school systems reopen to new ways of teaching and learning and that we provide the support teachers need to keep children learning. Today, we will hear the experience of three of Educated Child's partners, in fact, in adapting their education programs to the context of a pandemic and what that has meant for them in supporting teachers to redefine how teaching and learning happen. Our panelists today are Sonori Westgarb, Chief Executive Officer for Humana People to People India. Avinash Jha, Education Director at United World Schools Nepal. And Carolyn Pontefract, Director of Education at the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA. Each of the panelists will provide a short presentation on the work that they are doing in partnership with EAC and how they have adapted teaching and learning to the context of COVID-19. This will be followed by a moderated roundtable discussion during which we will we'll open up the um, session to audience participation and so you will be able to ask questions of the panelists. You can either post your questions in the chat function or raise your hand within the control panel and we can unmute you and you can ask your question directly to one of the panelists. At this time, I would like to ask my colleague and our partner, Sonori Westgard, Chief Executive Officer for Humana People to People India, HPPI, to join me as, and let us know what they're doing to adapt teaching and learning in this context. Sonori. Thank you, uh, Sabrina, for the introduction, and thank you, Educate a Child, for organizing this uh, webinar on a very important uh, topic of the role of teachers, specifically during uh, COVID-19, when schools are closed, and uh, letting us share the experiences of Humana People to People India in this area. Next. 
So uh, I will use this occasion to, uh, to, to, sh to explain two of Humana People to People, India's largest education initiatives, and uh, how the pandemic has impacted these initiatives and what we have done to continue the education for, for students. The two, uh, the two programs is uh, Kadam Stepa program, which is for out-of-school children and which we implement in partnership with Educate a Child and other partners and for in-school children with low learning levels. So we are in this program, we are working specifically with some of the margin, most marginalized and poorest uh, families. Then the second program is a teacher training program that trains new teachers in a two-year pre-service diploma of education program for primary school teachers. I want to highlight that all education initiatives implemented by Humana People to People see the teacher and the students as co-creators of knowledge and skills, where the students, as much as possible, takes the driver's seat in the process of learning. This has been very important also in the response to COVID and how to continue learning. Next. The Kadam Step Up program is a unique and individualized program where each child can learn at their own level and pace and stepwise acquire competences that bridge their learning gaps. This program is taken to scale through leveraging partnership and resources with state departments state departments of school education. Up to now, over 135,000 children, both out-of-school children and in-school children, have been bridged by the help of this program. Next. The necessary teacher training program is implemented within state-run teacher training institutions as a public-private partnership. Currently, there are 14 institutions across five states and over 12,000 teachers have been trained from 2009 to 2019. What is important about this training is that teachers are equipped with skills and attitudes to address the needs of children from resource poor families and communities and, and also to face crises like we have seen, uh, which we have been faced by with the pandemic. Next. So, Kadam, the Step Up program during COVID-19. So, you can say the main re immediate response to the pandemic was actually made by the teachers. We uh, quickly organized the, the teachers, the Kadam teachers, in uh, WhatsApp groups, and in uh, and we we invited for weekly online sessions where the teachers went through uh, through um, uh, capacity building as well as sharing experiences. What was remarkable was that the teachers, they of course immediately reached out to their, their students and their, their students' families to find out uh, how they were and to, to provide uh, staying safe messages and at the same time identify families that was very vulnerable since they have lost their livelihood. So the teachers also organized uh, relief aid, uh, fundraising and, and helped government to distribute food. At the same time, the, the program used well-known technologies to reach out to, uh, to children uh, and started providing education using WhatsApp and smartphones for approximately a third of the children and giving instruction on phone to another third. So approximately 65% of the children were, re were reached using well-known technology. In the teacher training program, it was easier to move the training online. It immediately moved online, maintaining the net structures and learning methodologies. The students at the necessary teacher training programs are, are used to self-learning. They are organized in, in what we call function groups of six and classes of around 50. So they continued to work together in WhatsApp groups and the, the teaching moved to uh, Google Classroom, Google Meet, etc. We could maintain pretty high attendance as the training continued to be very engaging and interactive also online. One of the main, main challenges we could see for many of the other teacher training colleges in the state was that the faculty did not have the necessary technical uh, capacity 
to take the training online. So we were asked to provide technical training to other teacher training institutions in the use of technology and also in methodology of how to keep the education interactive and engaging. Next. So what have we learned from this and the way forward? Well, we can see that for primary school children from resource poor homes, technology is not a long-term standalone solution. It is important to get back to some kind of organization of children in smaller groups with physical interaction with teachers. We have also seen that smaller groups and less time with teachers can be compensated by workbook, peer learning, and par parent and volunteer engagement. Next. For the, for the older students, such as our teacher training students, we have seen that smartphone with good data plan is an incredible resource for continuous education. Partially using a existing free software combined with access to government and other free cost learning platforms, but then keeping in mind to keep the education engaged and interactive. So the role of teacher here is very, very important to continue, even though it's gone online, that they still have daily interaction with the students, provide study tasks, give feedback to the assignments and so on. Next. So, uh, yeah, so in conclusion, we can say that our learning has been that uh, as, as we go into the, the new normal under the pandemic, the role of the teacher is very, very important. To, to facilitate, but at the same time, we have seen that the building on self-learning has enabled students to continue their education also when it moved online or it moved in smaller groups or moved in, in home learning. Thank you. Look forward to the discussion in the, in the panel discussion. Thank you, Sonori. It was very, for that night, comprehensive overview of what you're doing. Um, and in the discussion, I'm sure we'll touch on some more of how you and um, the other programs have really prepared the children to for that self-learning. So the work that you've done prior to the pandemic actually taking place that prepared the children to be able to take on some of the self-learning that they, they have done. And I really wanted to pick up on the idea that you presented of teachers and learners as co-creators of knowledge and skills. I think I would, I would like to hear some more about that when we get into the discussion as well. Thank you. Um, so next we have uh, our partner from United World Schools, Avinash Jha. So if you would go ahead. Hello everyone. First of all, on behalf of United World Schools, I would like to thank ESC for their partnership and support in recent years. Also, I would like to thank Education Above All for giving me this opportunity to talk in this very important topic. Next. United World Schools was founded in 2008 to improve life opportunities for some of the world's poorest children living in remote and marginalized communities. We vision a world in which all children have a chance to go to a school and to give every child access to free education. Basically, we provide, we, we build schools, train teachers, provide education and improve hygiene in schools as well as community. For this, we partner with local communities and supporters around the world to develop primary schools, hence teach the unrest. Currently, we work in Cambodia, Myanmar and Nepal, providing quality education to over 35,000 children and we aim to reach 50,000 children by 2021. Today, I'm briefly going to talk about how teaching and learning are happening in response to this pandemic situation. The various examples and interventions that I'll be using today will be from Nepal, uh, but interventions have been developed and adapted by inter-country and intra-departmental coordination that we were doing regularly before and more frequently after this pandemic hit the world. Next. On mid of March 2020, the government of Nepal announced a nationwide closure of all educational institutions due to the spread of COVID-19. 
According to UNICEF, there are around 8.7 million children between 3 to 16 years old that are affected due to the closure of schools. You can see this in the given picture. Almost half of these children falls in the age group of 5 to 9, or we can say these are the primary graded children. There are around 35,000 schools in the country that has been providing formal way of education. Experts say going to school is the best public policy tool available to raise skills. While school time can be fun and can raise social skills and social awareness from an economic point of view, the primary point of being in school is that it increases a child's social and, and cognitive ability. Even a very short period of missed school days has negative consequences on child's skills and development. We can see one of the indications from the loss of learning from the earthquake that hit in Pakistan in 2005. According to World Bank, closure of school for three months was equivalent to loss of learning for around like 1.5 to 2 years who lived closest to the fault line. Next. Various studies done in the past months shows that 3.2 million children in Nepal are at risk and they might never 5,000 children who are enrolled in UWS schools in Nepal were not getting access to any learning resources for the first few weeks after the lockdown. After two weeks of brainstorming during the time of crisis to keep the ball rolling, we as a team came up with some ideas to help mitigate this learning loss. Next. Like first we did a household mapping in the communities where we work uh, and we came across uh, this interesting result. You can see the result in the graph itself. And you can see that more than 90% of the household in our working community have got access to radio platform, either in the form of mobile phone or actual device itself. In very low household have no access to any device. Next. And based on the analysis of our mapping that we conducted in our villages, we came up with an idea of creating a radio program. Meanwhile, for the household where there was no access to any device, we took the help of our locally based community teachers and they were informed. We trained them and they, they took a lead to take our to, to start takeaway education in those communities. But before that, we trained our fellows. So basically, fellows are the motivated youth from the city area who go and teach in our remote community for two years. And then we also trained our some of our community teachers. Before this pandemic, pandemic hit the world, we never imagined that we could ever engage our fellows and teachers to record a radio program. That was like beyond our imagination, I must say. But with this crisis, we innovated something new for our communities, I should say. For two months, we were broadcasting a radio program across 10 different local FM stations in coordination with local government. Uh, we did a household survey with the help of our locally based community teachers for after 45 days after starting this radio program and results uh, like shows that on average like 10,000 10, primary age children listen to our radio program. We didn't invest much in this. We don't have any recording studio or any fancy thing available. We did this mobile phone and sharing recording overdrive as our staffs are working from home due to the lockdown. I can relate this to a saying called when there is a will, there is a way. Next. Besides radio program, we have done some other interventions that you can see in the picture, such as like community awareness on the watch and COVID-19. One of the interesting things that I would like to share here, we, we also didn't imagine we could ever meet our teachers over a virtual platform and one day we'll train them in an effective way using a virtual platform. After the closure of our schools, we were just dialing phone numbers to communicate with our teachers and sometimes a Facebook messenger group to share important information and some awareness related posters out of nowhere one day we thought of using a zoom platform because uh, then zoom was slightly famous in nepal over social media we invited our teachers for a zoom meeting but surprisingly uh, almost 70 percent of our teachers attended the meeting though active participation was very less due to the technological limitations in few weeks time we could see a positive participation of teachers all uh, all of the different interventions that I'm talking about today, today you can see here. Next. So till now, like we have organized so many trainings for our community teachers and fellows using equally important for teachers. 
to keep them motivated and bring them back so that like they can bounce back better and continue our journey of teaching the onris in once physical once we are back in physical world again because we provide all kind of training such as psychological first aid and mental health thing our teachers feel we care for them and that is why in return they care for our children more than they ever do despite this pandemic we are able to create a bonding between our staff teachers to our local uh, teachers and we are they are trying and we are trying uh, to best use uh trying to best use of make best use of them so that like they can take care of our children next i'll show you some numbers uh here so look uh, let's look at some of the numbers these numbers show like our impact till date of our, our different intervention with this i would like to conclude my presentation here and if you have any questions i'll try to answer them in the next round of webinar and thank you for listening to me Thank you so much, Avinash. Very insightful to the work that you're doing in Nepal. And, and I pre uh, particularly appreciate the way that you've drawn insights and learning from past experiences such as the earthquake and other, um, other things that have happened. It's so important that we, don't, that we don't operate in a vacuum, but that we continue to learn from, from the experiences that we have as we have a wealth of knowledge um, and ways to operate. I'd love to hear more about the, the fellows and the um, work that you were doing through social and mental health, particularly for the teachers, but also to help the teachers support the children. Um, next in our presentations is Caroline Pontefract from ONRA. And so, Caroline, it is, I'd love to welcome you to share the experience that ONRA has, which is really unique given that you operate a large yes. school system yourselves. Exactly. Thank you. And thank you, Sabrina. And thank you for inviting ARA, which I am representing today, and also UNESCO, with my UNESCO hat on. Um, so I'm going to tell you about UNRWA and what we, you know, how we kind of address this and what we've learned about, you know, the role of teachers and how we can support teachers. Can I have the first slide, please? Next slide, please. Sorry, that is the first. <laughs> Sorry. The first real slide, please. Just to say that UNRWA those of you who don't know, it's the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees. It's been uh, actually in existence since about 1949, nearly 70 years, and we were born of conflict. You know, we were born of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the displaced Palestinians. And we continue to work in conflict. You know, many com even in my experience here, we've had the Gaza War, we've had the Syria War. You know, we've had lots of you know different challenges, and before that, of course, you know there, there was the Lebanon civil war, there was the Intifada. You know, a lot of different challenges over these 70 years of delivering education. We have a very high demand for education, so we're a really uh, strange UN agency because we have real schools and real children, but at the same time, we're a UN, UN agency, and everything that means in terms of how we work and how we work with other agencies and at the parameters of our work. We have a because we are in what we call host countries. And we're in Jordan, we're in Lebanon, we're in Gaza, we're in West Bank, and we're in Syria. So we have, you know, four host countries, and we follow the host country curriculum. So even though we have separate schools, we follow the host country curriculum, and we follow the school calendar, quite important with regard to this issue. And we also follow and use study plans generally. So if a host government says, you know, you've got four lessons of maths for grade five, we tend to have four lessons of maths for grade five. The other uh, information I think is useful to know is that you know, over the last 10 years, we embarked on a very big reform of UNRWA education system. And this was to strengthen the system more, to really strengthen the system so that those teachers in those classrooms could realize their own potential by real, and re thus realize the potential of the children. So our reform was what we refer to as systemic. It was system-wide, it was the policies, it was the frameworks, it was the capacity development. But the whole you know, center of it was children in the classroom and how the teacher is able to support their learning. We also then, in the, in the middle of the reform actually, had developed an education and emergency approach because this was a Syria uh, conflict. And here EAC were really a crucial part and they really got us going on what became you know, our education approach, which has actually you know, sadly been kind of continuing for quite a few years as the conflict continues. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So when it happened, so yes, we're used to conflicts, we're used to education in you know, emergencies, we're used to demonstrations, challenges in Lebanon, all sorts of different things going on. But it's like this was completely different. Suddenly all the schools closed, you know, all kind of 530,000 children at home, 9,000 TIBIT students, the teacher training students, 
everyone at home, you know, unbelievable, not heard of, never had that scale before. So it's like everyone had to kind of really think, okay, what do we do? And the first thing was, okay, what have we got? What have we got in place? And because we had a lot of experience with education in conflict emergencies, and because we had the reform, it's like, okay, we've got some things there in place. We've got some, you know, key ideas, key ways of working, key structures in the field, you know, and we have learned a lot over our work with conflict. So that was very important. Communication is like, okay, who needs to talk to who? And what about, you know, how can we make sure that, you know, we're not all talking to the same people, not bombarding, say, parents with various guidance. How can we make sure that we talk to teachers about this, et cetera? And then the other thing that was very key that we had in place was what we call a teacher policy. I mean, it's, it is a teacher policy, but it's been uh, since in place since 2014. It's a very substantive teacher policy, which really, again, was the, uh, trying to strengthen the teaching profession by career progression opportunities in a meaningful way. A lot of professional development, and one very interesting point about our professional development, I think, is our focus was a kind of self-learning approach, learning in situ, you know, very much the, their own tutor in the materials, try things out in the classroom, come together with their peers. So our teachers and our school principals and even our education partners had experience themselves of learning you know, through self-study and a strong structure in the field. So we have this in place already. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just to come back to, we have an education in emergency approach. This education in emergency approach, and I say approach very, very specifically, it's not a, you know, not a program, etc. It's an approach because it basically builds on what's there. You know, we had to look at what we needed to do in an emergency, what we needed to do more of. You know, for example, we need to do more psychosocial support often in an emergency. What we might need to do differently and learning. We have to do learning very, very differently in an emergency. We have to think how we can do learning depending on what's actually happening to our learners. We need to think what do we not normally do health and safety i mean obviously at some level but this suddenly is a big issue what do we need to do with regard to health and safety in an emergency and monitoring and evaluation what do we need to find out we're doing this how can we measure if what we're doing is having any impact how can we think about what else we might need to do and with regard to this crisis we had these programs these sorry these approaches in place we had these approaches in place but they were very much a conflict model so we had the psychosocial learning, children used to gather together, they had counselling together, they played games, a lot of emphasis on games. Our health and safety, of course, was all about, you know, uh, was about explosive devices, it was about, you know, safe places, etc. staying safe with conflict. Uh, our learning did actually had included self-learning to some extent, but there was always an idea of children coming together, maybe not in the school, to have this support. They would have learning material, but they would have teachers there. And the monitoring and evaluation obviously speaks for itself. So now for this crisis, this pandemic, it's like, okay, well, we can't bring children together to do the psychosocial support. You know, the whole idea is they've got to be separately, What? but they might need it more than ever. You know, we can't bring children together for learning. So this self-learning has really got to mean self-learning. Health and safety, well, it's nearly different now. It's all about the mask. It's about hand washing it's about the distance it's this real awareness and monitoring and evaluation therefore will be totally different so what we did was we actually looked at what we had in place what our strengths were what our systems were and then our education in emergency strands to think okay they are the same you know it's nothing fundamentally different here but how we're going to address these needs has to be different and therefore we worked to you know to do just that and I think first of all though, and that's what I want to talk about on the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, I can't read that from this distance. <laughs> I need to look at this. So I think what I want to say kind of like between the slides is that we had this kind of strategic approach. We as a headquarters working completely to support the field and that our five fields, that's what we call the fields of operation, our five fields, we had this kind of approach. We looked to the systems, we looked to the structures, but in a way, it kind of took a bit of time, not much time. Our fields were amazingly impressive that they were going forward as well. But who was on the front line? The teachers. The teachers were there. You know, the teachers were there. They were the closest to the children, even if those children were at home. They lived in the same community. And the teachers, therefore, had to do an awful lot in those early days. And then maybe even as the programme was developing and we were beginning to think about what self-learning really meant, meant and we were thinking about the health and safety, whose responsibility is it for these messages? You know, maybe we began to kind of 
much more map onto our own system. But I think there was a lot of expectations upon our teachers or, and a lot of self-expectation upon them. You know, and they basically, in the studies we've done later, because I talked about the importance of monitoring evaluation, and we did have a teacher study, and we had talked to teachers, and we did this over the telephone, by the way, we don't believe in online studies, but we know that online is a real challenge, to talk to teachers and to say, you know, and they, they just shared the kind of challenges they were facing. And some of these challenges, perhaps, you know, in not knowing really, what is this remote learning? What is expected of me? Am I supposed to do this? Should I be writing to the parents? You know, what should I talk to my education specialist? What can I expect of my school principal? You know, what about the psychosocial? Is it me that does that? Should I talk to the counsellor? I don't have any internet myself, or my phone is, you know, I can't afford the internet bundle. I'm not really quite sure about all this technology myself, and yet somehow I'm supposed to switch to become this, you know, tech savvy person overnight so many many things that i think that were expected of the teachers and they did a valiant job you know and i said it wasn't that the field and the structure were not behind them they were but teachers were there at the front line and i think that we therefore we learned such a lot and i want to come back to our monitoring evaluation generally because we really looked at we talked to parents you know as kind of uh, we we're moving forward in the pandemic and going towards the end of the year and asked them about the children's access to technology because there was a lot of reliance on technology. I think there was a lot of reliance perhaps on online platforms, on self-learning going online. You know, there was a lot of reliance, but our chiefs, and our chiefs are the kind of top persons in the field, they also knew that lots of children had challenges here. So they were finding out how many children had challenges. And then our parents survey, which we did across the agency, really showed that actually an awful lot of our children, even if they had access you know, to that mobile phone, maybe only for one hour a day, because it's their mum's mobile phone and they've got three or four brothers and sisters. So even if they could access it, you couldn't assume that they could access it all day long. So we learned such a lot. You know, the connectivity could be bad in Gaza and Lebanon. The electricity goes off an awful lot. You know, the cost of it. So we, we learned such a lot and we learned, learned such a lot by listening to the teachers as well and talking to the teachers. And also, you know, obviously as being educators ourselves and just listening and reading and seeing what was going on. So we worked together. And I think that we were there, therefore in a much better position as we go forward, you know, now and we are going forward and we're going backwards, you know, now with regard to the school model. So if I could have the next slide, please. Next and last slide. Thank you. OK, so just to say, what did we learn? One thing we learned is, you know, we can't all think, you know, and come up with these clever, clever things, remote learning, this and this and this. And then suddenly say, here you are, teachers. <laughs> We've got this wonderful model for you. The teachers have to be involved. And they also have to be involved in making the decisions as to what's appropriate. They know about children's access. They know about some of the challenges of electricity. So let's get them on board and let's have them help. They've got to have clear roles. They can't suddenly overnight be, you know, textbook writers, you know, school counsellors, you know, this and this. They have to know what their role is and what the role of our others are, you know, and who will support them. We can't assume that they have confidence in using technology either. We need to find out and we need to help them as well. And then as a system, and I say this is an UNRWA system, but it's a, an education system, we have to work at the right level. So we have to work, you know, whether it's the agency level, which is kind of us at the headquarters, the actual field level, which is our chief, an area within a field, and the school level. What do we expect of each one, you know, with regard to supporting that teacher to support those children? And I think last and, you know, really last but definitely not least, we have to monitor and evaluate everything in different ways with you know whether it's phone calls whether it's questionnaires whether it's you know making doing surveys we have to monitor and then we have to very very crucially we have to change what we do in order what we learn from the monitoring evaluation and that's what we've done in UNRWA we really really learned a lot and as we go forward in a very mixed you know very challenging on and off kind of um, system at the moment with regard to schooling we have learned and we are doing things differently but we know that there's so much more to learn but what we don't want to do is leave the teacher on her own to learn that thank you sabrina and thank you everybody thank you so much caroline i would like to um at this time ask um our other colleagues and partners to mm -hmm. join us um on screen so this is the fun part of our webinar where we get to chat about some different topics and there's so much to unpack from everything that each of you have presented on and i've got a few questions for you you may have some questions for each other and of course we're going to take questions from the audience or from the attendees 
Um, so to, to start us off, I would like to get more in depth about this idea of preparing children to self-learn. What is it that, what needs to be in place? What have you seen done prior to COVID that allowed the children that you were working with to be able to do that self-learning or the support that they needed if they weren't prepared during the time of self-learning? Um, and and how, how did the teachers work with parents to be able to do that as co-facilitators of learning? Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you can say what since our program as working with Educate Your Child, we are working mainly with out of school children, though we are also using the same methodology for, for in school children with low learning levels who need bridging. But we actually designed the system based on workbooks where, where children where, where link totally linked to the competences according to the curriculum so that teacher can also recognize what is to be learned. But it enabled the children to, after a baseline, to join the program on their learning level. So, you know, I may be a grade, you know, according to my age, I may be in grade four, but I have to start in grade one because that's my learning level. And uh, because of the because of these workbooks with more than 2,000 exercises across five uh, five grades and four subjects, children were able to learn at different levels. And then they were organized in in groups of three. We call them trios, and uh, they work individually, but the, the children help each other. So there's always one who a bit more experienced in each trio who helps the others. And then the teacher's role is to facilitate this. So, you know, this methodology enabled the children under, during COVID when they uh, were, 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 had to stay home. So uh, to, to quite quickly understand instructions from the teacher, if they could relate to their workbooks, they could, you know, they were also used to working in groups. So siblings that were in the same home or you know, people are work, uh, living in a lane, so, so children from the same community could get together. So I think this, so what was important, they were used to working in groups, learning from each other. They were used to use this system of uh, doing exercises, which also were received on WhatsApp from those children who have access to WhatsApp. And then, uh, because during the normal program, the parents are very much engaged in, uh, because that's, if you want out of school children to come to school and be retained in school, you have to engage the parents. So uh, even though these, most of the children are first generation learners, and that means the parents cannot really support them academically, but they can support them emotionally, you know, give support that they have to go to school and so on. And uh, so there's a lot of traditions in the program that, that really help to, uh, to get the pa parents on board immediately during this time. So as I said, the main challenge was, of course, this, these children was only, uh, you know, not everybody has access to a phone. So that was the main challenge. Thank you, Sonori. Avinash, uh, Caroline, would one of you want to add anything to that? Go ahead, Caroline. We have to unmute first. very very small dot okay so i think the key point was what you uh you just said was about normal and this is really important because a certain we were talking i think the other day about you know teacher training and what teacher training needs to be normally you know and it needs to be the type of training that we all know which would help children become critical thinkers help children to become autonomous learners and often it isn't so I think that this, you know, unfortunately is an opportunity, I think, with regard to coronavirus. It's actually okay. We've got to do it the wrong way around, but we can learn from this. We should have had classrooms, and you talked about normal classrooms, where children were being asked open questions, where they were being asked this and this. Okay, we maybe we didn't do that, but now we've got this opportunity to try to help our children become autonomous learners. But it means getting that right with regard to the remote learning model and the blended model. Yeah, you know, it needs we need to get the right balance in terms of how we develop the materials, in terms of the type of questions we write, open questions in terms of trying to get any children to work together. So ideally we would have you know a good system, our teachers would be trained in a certain way, the classrooms will be working in a certain way, and thus the children could take that into 
a full remote learning. I'm not saying there wouldn't be challenges, but they would have that. But now we have to say, okay, in many places they haven't had that. Let's use that opportunity, especially when you've got a hybrid model, if you've got children coming in and out, let's use that opportunity to really try to get that, those approaches in place. So I think that, yes, ideally, you'd be going that way, but if we have to, let's go that way. Thank you. Yeah. Avinash, do you I have just, anything that you would like to add to that? Uh, yeah, I would just li like to add one thing. So mm -hmm. normally, if we imagine a school day scenario, so norm in a year, mm -hmm. around like 200 and 220 days, there is a school day, and normally mm -hmm. children stay in school for like six to mm -hmm. seven hours a day, but the rest of the time they are at home. So basically, mm -hmm. even like this is uh, due to the kind of this uh, pandemic situation, it has also uh, like mm -hmm. uh, at least like parents can think that like most of the time they are even, even parents can take part in their learning process so it's also like they should understand this mm -hmm. uh, because like uh, from last six months mm -hmm. only also they are they're they only staying at home so also uh, it, it's a kind of like realizing that parents should uh, realize that that we should mm -hmm. be part of the education process and then in longer run like mm -hmm. uh, the home is also because like the home is the greatest school you know so mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so true and so important. Your home is like, that is where like we start to learn and, and learning begins mm -hmm. at, in the home. And I think this is um, mm -hmm. anyway, you, you touched on something that we've been hearing throughout the series of webinars. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had one specifically on the role of parents, but mm -hmm. the, even mm -hmm. in many of our programs and in, in that we the EAC supports. We have first generation learners, you know, we have ch children mm -hmm. that are going to school, parents may be illiterate or have never yeah, gone to school yeah. or have no mm -hmm. literacy. But we must realize that they can still support the learning of their children. They may not be able to do the academic work, but there are things and there's support um, that they can do to make sure that the child continues uh, to learn while, while at home. Mm -hmm. I'm going can I just to add uh, something, Sabrina, there, because that's yeah. actually good. Because I feel quite strongly about lots of things, actually. But I feel very strongly about the idea, you know, this site we shouldn't expect teachers to become the education system in this. I also think we shouldn't expect parents to become teachers. And I'm not saying that any of our colleagues are. But I think it's a very good point that you said, yes, teachers can, I mean, parents can support. They can support, for example, by our parents could support by getting the message through the WhatsApp in terms of what the work was, you know, especially for younger children. But I think we have to get that, you know, really right, that balance, because we really should not expect a lot of these parents who were also, you know, living, I mean, they're living in a pandemic or they're living in a the conflict themselves. They've got other things. There's many siblings. They've got many, many challenges, you know, to do with both their time and perhaps their, you know, their ability to help in this way. So I think, again, you know, let's not use the pandemic to kind of, you know, kind of really distort the roles let's think clearly of what you said and what we all believe parents have a key role but they're not teachers you know and we mustn't make them feel and that i know we did have some parents in one of our fields in unra complaining because it was like they were being bombarded by messages <laughs> from very keen and enthusiastic teachers and it's like please please you know so i think it's really important that we kind of get the balance right there thank you I think, I think um, almost all parents during this period of time can um, relate to to that. I know my colleagues um, can. Uh, I would like to go ahead and take a question from the audience. We have um, Ashok Kumar who has his hands his hand raised. So I'm going to ask our uh, event organizer to, to unmute him so he can pose his question to our panel. Ashok? Ashok, you're unmuted. If you want to go ahead and pose your question to the panel. And we may have to come back to him. Um, so it is, we'll come back to him should he raise his hand again. I'm going to move on to my, one of my next questions then. Um, and I would really like to kind of get into 
or continue to get into this idea of teachers being part of the system and the defining of the roles, but they're not the entire system. Um, I think you've, you've both or all have touched on that, but there's something that, that came out um, a little bit with, especially with Avinash and Sonori in your presentations as well, about preparing teachers to work in the communities and with the communities and that role that they play there and how that has supported the role that they played during COVID in order to really get the community support and buy-in to help the children um, continue their learning during this period. So I'll let whoever unmutes fastest jump in. Okay, I can start. Um, I think I, I want to answer this from perspective of like three perspective of our teachers because we work with three types of teachers. One is the teacher students who are preparing to become fresh new teachers. And then the, you can say the ordinary government, uh, government primary school teachers. And then teachers that we employ directly to be teachers for to school children within a program. And uh, what we can see, um, you can say what we can see is, uh, yeah, I think what is true is that the system needs to be changed in the sense that teachers need to be prepared much more uh, to kind of address the needs of the children in their particular community. Because as you know, a country like India, and I think it's the same in, in many other, in any other countries, that children are not the same, you know, if you come from a rural area, urban area, rich, poor, I mean, there are so many different kinds of, of children and very often, at least in India, you know, schools are also kind of, um, you can say, as many of the government schools have mainly have children from very poor families. So, uh, and what we have seen both in our training of the new teachers is that, you know, what is very important for them to be prepared is that they can actually not just follow the curriculum, and kind of teach, but they have to understand the specific needs of the children and their background and where they come from. And that kind of training is needed, and that is often lacking in uh, in the regular uh, uh, teachers. It's I mean, it's a very very varied. You have all kinds of teachers. Many are brilliant teachers, and some are are lacking that kind of understanding. I mean, they are too you know going too much kind of top down when the system is top down. You teach according to the curriculum, which you are told by your, you know, the system tells you how to teach. So I think what needs to be do, uh, be done, and I think this is also, for example, in the new national education policy in India, it opens up much more for the teachers to kind of be more inventive and actually adaptive teaching. And uh, yeah, they actually use that word adaptive teaching and adaptive assessment. And I think that is really, I mean, that's. I was very happy to read that in the new education policy because I think that is the change we need to see as a teachers cannot just kind of follow whatever instructions that come from the state or the districts, they have to adapt to the specific needs in their classroom. And this may sound, you know, maybe in other communities, in other, um, it may, uh, other teachers may say, of course, that's what I do. That's you know, that's what I always do. But that's not the case in, in, in many uh, schools in, in India, for example. And I think hopefully with the new education policy and this kind of shift, we will see a change in the system that will enable and also train teachers to be able to do that. Uh, shall Thank I add you. something else? Please. Uh, I, I think uh, Snowy also mentioned uh, so, so many things, but uh, like uh, we teachers are basically normally what we see in normal in normal time what you see is like teachers are, are actually a tool. Basically, we engage them to help our children learn something. Uh, but like in, uh, in in normal time, we never cared about them a lot. But like this time also made us realize that like. They should they should first they should feel motivated so that like they, in turn like they can uh, take care of our children because like all, uh, earlier like we just uh, we ask we are asking our teachers to te teach our children but now uh, even like we are providing some other kind of skills so that like uh, they they feel motivated and they also feel that they are a part of this education system 
they are not like uh, just just a sim. Uh, they they are basically a bigger part of this. Uh, they they can play a big bigger role here. So first thing is that. Another thing is like we uh, we always think about like the learning loss among the child. So even like oh, in my presentation also I touched upon. Uh, in Pakistan, when there was like earthquake, so there was a kind of like a lot of learning loss. But like we never talk about like uh, these things for teachers. So even like if teachers teachers are not going to school for last last six months, so even when they return to when there will when there will be a normal situation, even like when they go do go back to the school, they, like they might not have all the things, uh, all the skills available. Like they they might have might have like forgotten a few of the things. So like they also need to like keep on. Uh, like uh, we need to keep on training those things. Keep, keep, we we need to keep them like uh, motivated. We need to keep provide some extra kind of skills because like training and learning never stops. So that uh, this time also uh, like we can in, in, engage them. And I can also relate to some of the examples that we used here. So like we provide some kind of like psychological first aid training so that like basically even like when the normal situation will come like they can at least like look listen and link anything uh, about the children so I, I i can say basically the 3l rule they can children can apply like teachers can apply 3l rule in the school thing also so yeah uh, that's from my end thank you thank you so much i think that's we this whole webinar series has been about keep children learning but i think you just made a very important point that we also Teachers learning mm -hmm. um, that it's we know that if we don't use skills we lose skills um, so often so that's, mm -hmm. that's so important and I Caroline I know you have you have something <laughs> to add to, to, to always thank you points that, no, thank you no no because I, I think it's very key both you know what both my colleagues said but you know you made the story you talked about adapt you know and now it's really you know you can adapt when you've got something to adapt with, you know. So that comes back to the very fundamental thing is we've got to get the teacher training right. You know, we've got to have a teacher training where the key principles in terms of being a teacher and how to support children's learning and how children learn. And then actually it's amazing how you can adapt, you know, because if you've got these key principles kind of driving you in terms of how, you know, you want need children to do this, you need them to think, they need to have opportunity to do this, you can then adapt. But what's so difficult and what we asked a lot of our teachers to do was to adapt to something that they didn't have that kind of core, you know, they didn't have that core. And we suddenly expected them to be, you know, all singing, all dancing, you know, like techno savvy, counselling, etc. So the teacher training, you know, that we have to do has to be core. It has to be not about teaching them, you know, specifics. It has about being teaching them to teach and to think, which means really that you have to use the same approach teaching developing our teachers as we want the teachers to develop, do with the children. You know, we have to have that same organization of learning. We have to ask them to think critically. We cannot tell them how to teach and expect them to suddenly, you know, become amazingly innovative and kind of open it up. So it really has implications for a teacher training that does unto the teachers what we want them to do to the children, you know, and then but make it explicit, you know, and discuss that. And I think this is the opportunity now you know the opportunity there's always an opportunity to make clear and to go to our teachers now and say okay when you were working with parents what did you do you know how did you talk to them okay why did you do it like that you know what could you have done so to get them to reflect on this experience now how did you support the children what challenges did you find with those children's work you know what does that therefore mean because they have learned a massive amount now you know but sometimes we learn and it's just lying there below the surface so I think our role, all of us as educators, is to perhaps now, uh, you know, tap into that kind of resource and that reserve of learning and help them think what they learned and what it means in terms of general teaching and learning. Thank you. So important. I, I just, everything that you guys are saying, you, know, you are all saying, we do. We have a question from the audience, and Avinash, I believe this is probably um, directed at you. Um, Surya Jha asks, what impact the radio program has brought about in policy change? Yeah, uh, this is a really good question. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this question. Uh, so, so basically when, uh, like in, in Nepal, when we started this radio program, uh, I think 
there are very there were very few organization like who were work who were this, who were also who were starting this thing uh, so even like in the in the beginning even we were also not sure what kind of impact it will create because like we were just brainstorming that and then later on we started our program but like when we did a survey after 45 days that i also mentioned in my presentation so that time like uh, we got to you know that a lot of children like uh, like they are like listening to our radio program uh, and then basically they also know the timing of the program so basically at least like uh, and and one thing uh, uh, like that we did basically we, we also engaged our fellows and our uh, our community just both for the program so even when children were listening to the program at least some of the children like basically from our schools they can relate the thing to the classroom so when they hear the name of their teachers or fellows so they can relate oh yeah i know this teacher at least like when the uh, the broadcast thing starts like at least they can relate those things so that's how uh, they got enthusiastic to uh, men, uh, like uh, listen to the that program but later on uh, like uh, even the, the, the in, in the local level there was like no kind of like any any plans or, or other kind of thing but later on like they uh, what they real, even the local government what they realized was this radio program can be a means because like uh, we really cannot start, start school at this point of time. So the all the other alternative means means could be either we could start a takeover education or this radio program could be one thing because like uh, in the remote area there is no access to internet, no access to computer and television. So only the available option could be the radio program. So because of that, uh, in our community basically a lot of uh, like all the local government they started adopting this uh, as a part of their policy. Uh, on, until the situation will be normal and in uh, I, I cannot sort like uh, like all but like even in the uh, national system also just like few days back there was a kind of like student learning facilitation guide guideline came in and that also included radio as a formal way of like uh, 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 that at least recognized radio as a thing that could at least like though it is not as effective as the real classroom setting but at least like it could be one means to stop uh the dropout rate once the schools open so a little bit changes these are some kind of changes that uh the radio program has been created thank you very interesting i think and i'm going to take one another question from our attendees but when we when we come back i would like to touch a little bit more on um the need for some policy changes i think you know carolyn you were talking about you have to have things in place in order to be able to adapt what you have, but then what policies need to be in place in order to make that possible? What, what enabling environment do we need to create for not only the teachers, but for the systems to be flexible, right? Because it's, we've learned that going forward, we can't have these unadaptive, unflexible systems. We have to be able to, to have flexible learning structures. Um, and then another thing I would like us to touch on as well is some of the equity issues that have come up. I think the, the the COVID has really brought out some of the inequities that we knew were there and that as EAC, we try to help children and communities overcome, but all of a sudden you're out of school and everyone wants to do distance learning when you don't have the technology or you don't have the resources or some of the other things or your teachers don't have the learning. So um, if when, we'll, we'll come back to those, but let me, I think Salam Deeb has um, their hand up. So um, if I can ask Brian to unmute Salam and then to ask their question. Salam? Hello. Hello. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Thank, thank you, Sabrina, and thanks to the our panelists, or you see, the director of education, actually, Dr. Caroline, for uh, all their comprehensive presentation, actually, and um, good thoughts that we all learn from each other, actually, and experiences. And as uh, Dr. Caroline mentioned regarding the reconceptualization of the education emergency in terms of the uh, self-learning, um, health and hygiene safety, psychosocial support and mental evaluation here. And would like just to highlight 
the uh, idea of learning, strengthening the system through learning organization to push towards having in a different manner, different ways actually, learning organization, encouraging staff at different level, especially teachers on peer coaching, because as an example, we may have teachers who are good in technology, let's say, better than others. So they can learn, we can, we, we should empower them, encourage them to learn from each other, actually. Creating community of practice, again, particularly among even school principals, because they have different experiences, again, in dealing with the community and linking to the community and co-facilitation, all of these things, I think we need, again, to look into it into another perspective, encouraging the people to uh, work with each other, actually, to learn from each other, uh, everyone has his own strengths actually so so that so that we 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 we, we make it easier for the um, uh, the system actually to 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 support um, all the stakeholders uh, the teachers the staff the community the parents the co-facilitation actually between teachers and parents uh, encouraging the parent teacher associations to have a different role again, you see, in, in, in emphasizing the new roles actually of the parents, which is completely different. We should not look at parents to, to replace teachers, sure. We should not expect this. This is a mistake, maybe some people think that. So um, uh, the idea of learning organization, I would like to hear maybe more from Dr. Caroline and others. Sure, we are in continuous uh, meetings with Dr. Caroline. Today we had our meeting and we had such questions. But I would like to share her thoughts also with not only uh, us as honor but with others in this context. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Carolyn, and then everyone else. So I, can I just say, because it's such an interesting you know, point, and it's like we've all been talking about you know, the children's learning, and then it's like, okay, the teachers need to learn, and then those who support the teachers need to learn. And we, you know, whether we're a director of education, whether we're a chief like Salem, we need to learn. So we need to think here, you know, and this was one real experience where we had to think, what do we do? Why did we do that? Why did we change that? And really think, try to make it explicit. And we did that. We did it here within the UNRWA education program. We actually thought about you know, what we did and when we changed the direction, why did we do that? Because you know, it, as that idea of being a learning organization, thank you, Salon, that's very, it's actually a good point. We can't expect our teachers to be these amazing critical thinkers and this and this, if they are there on their own. I mean, it's got to go all the way through the system. Yeah. And I, I think to come back to your earlier question, Sabrina, about the policies that are in place, that I think the COVID-19 experience is one way of kind of forming the policies. You know, as I said, so, OK, it's coming from this experience and we can go up and up and up, whether the radio becomes part of the kind of national approach and put the policies in place from what we've learned. But we can only do that if we reflect on what we learned and what it means about the role of parents, the role of teachers. And then we could go upwards or ideally you have policies in place, but they came from upwards. I mean, downwards, sorry. They came from what would mattered. So our policies in UNRWA came from that vision of the classroom and what the children will be doing, how they will be working, what the teacher will be saying. And it's like, then you take that and think, okay. And then you go back, what does that mean for the teacher? What does that mean for their training? What does it mean for the support they must have? What does it mean for this? What does it mean for that? And then you get a policy. You know, which is actually clearly saying this is what we want and this is think how we achieve it. Now, we have that opportunity now again to say, OK, let's all reflect on what we learned, what we did, how we work together. And then let's kind of unpack that to kind of you know, put in place a kind of vision for learning. But then the structures and the systems that will support that. And so I think that it's such an opportunity and said it should always come from what we want in that classroom anyway. And this maybe wasn't a classroom this time, it was a whole different world. But I think that we, we can take that opportunity. So thank you for that. And thank you, Sam, for those key points. I think I, I see Sanori kind of unmuting himself there. So do you want to jump in? Sure. I, I think uh, it was really a good point raised. And uh, I think also Caroline has touched on most of the things. Um, I can just support that, you know, if, if we could really but you can say from our own experience with our own teachers, then it's one of the most important, you can say, dynamics is the meeting. You know, our whole structure uh, in the Kadam program is that teachers, they meet every week, 
they share experiences, they inspire each other and so on. So that's, you know, yes, I agree 100% that it's really a lot. And we, and we could also see how the whole response to COVID-19 came first from the teachers and then they kind of asked the organization to support them in how they could address this. And then how you turn this into policies for teachers in, in, in government schools, that, that's the challenge. And, uh, but I think it's one thing is to, to create the examples, like also Karen had said, you know, first we learn from the teachers and then we, we advocate for that becoming policies. But I think we can only, you know, promote and, and create a lot of good examples so that people can really see our teachers you know, so teachers feed back to the to their uh, to their superiors and into the system that we really need these kind of regular meetings. We need to learn from each other. Uh, I think he called it a community of good practice. I mean, I think we have so many good examples where it, it shows it's so important, but it's too little of it in the in 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 the normal system. We can say so. Yes, definitely, we should really promote that. And uh, and I would say yes in in the whole response to COVID, we have said where where teachers get together and, and come up with solutions, it it goes much faster than they kind of wait for directives from above. Arunesh, do you do you want to add anything to that? If yeah. if not, I, there was a follow up question to the radio that I'm gonna I'm gonna just pose to you now, and you can add on to you know what Caroline and Sonori have have talked about about policy and some of the other and the communities of practice and and supporting the teachers in that way. But just so you can also address this question is um, how do you monitor how many listeners you have for the radio program? Uh, so currently, like as per our survey, uh, around in our working districts, there are 10,000 children, uh, primary age children, who are listening to our radio program. Uh, but like that was like we conducted that two months back. So again, like we need to uh, again, again we need to do a, a kind of like re reconduct a service to see because like actual number might have worked uh, increased more because like even local government has adopted these kind of thing because like this that is the only thing that is happening at the in the community level at the moment so i think the number will of course go go up uh, so that's my answer to my the radio question and the thing i would like to add from so caroline and snore mentioned all, all the things i just like to add something from the policy point of angle so normally in the developing countries like nepal and also in the rest of the developing country countries in the world normally what happens is like in the education sector normally all kind of training that have been uh, that is in place on all kind of like education policy that is in place that is like they just bought something that is good and this is and, and that was just they are just trying to implement that thing but like this situation has actually given even the government and even the policy makers a time to like unpack those things so that like they can identify the real problems and then set the agenda so that and accordingly they can design the policy and then uh, they can implement the policy and then later on they can evaluate the policy. So it's a kind of like it has given the opportunity to unpack all those things and then look from a different angle because like the same kind of policy could not work in all place, all places. Even like at the moment, even the government has realized that even in the even even in two different municipalities, policies could be different because depending upon the different scenario. So this is also time to like 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 reinvent the policy thing and then make it like locally. Uh, adaptable thing. So yeah, thank you. Bit of the active research approach to policy making. <laughs> um, can I just say, uh, can I also say, Sabrina, that I completely agree. But a policy can then be yes, it's different. There's a policy and there's a kind of implementation of the policy. But I think the key principles and the practices have to be the same. You know, they're the same whether it's India, whether it's UNRWA. <laughs> So you have that, but then of course, as you, as, as you said, is the customization of that, you know, and what matters and how you do things within the different contexts, that must change. But I think that, you know, a policy has to say the key things that we believe about children's learning or about how teachers work. But then it's, as I said, it very much has to be customized, you know, at the level, you know, and, and, in, and interpreted. But without kind of, you know, as I said, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, keeping those key principles. But thinking, okay, what matters more in our area? Maybe it's more of this, less of that, etc. 
just to, to enhance what was said. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Objective, objective, but only the approaches could be different. I, one of the things I've really picked up on is this idea of creating policy from the ground up as well. Taking taking what is working and what is appropriate in on the in the in the schools on the ground, bringing the attention of those who can actually influence and make the policies policies to that, showing them that this works, that this is a good way of going, and then influencing the policy as the the national or higher level policy as you go up. Um, so kind of creating policy through action. Um, we hope, let's see if he still has her hand, his hand up or she, Daham Sharma, uh, if you can unmute and you can go ahead and ask your question to the panelists. Daham? We'll uh, maybe come back to, to Daham. I will have another question though from our attendees. Um, this is, I'm going to address, well, I'm gonna address this to all of you. Can you share your experience and the effects that being out of school for a long period are found among the children when schools reopen? And I would, I'm gonna to add to our attendees question and say, what are the effects that we've noticed? Because we talk about the psychosocial support that children need, but what about the psychosocial support and the effects of long periods of school closures or absenteeism on teachers as well? Go ahead, Sonari. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, of course, when you talk, the, the children that we work with, of course, the, the school is, is uh, very important for them. It's, you know, not just, it's not just a place of learning. It's also a place where you get your midday meal every day. It's a place where uh, you can say in many ways you, you, uh, you are safe and so on. So um, I think, it, it is, I think we can't really imagine the impact it has as it has on children. But I think the main impact uh, on uh, our children is, is the loss of learning. I mean, they will be losing almost a year of learning. And, uh, and even children who are, have very low learning levels, you know, who, who are struggling to, to keep up with, uh, with, the, with the education, they will, of course, be even further behind. And I think, uh, so, so I think the main, as I see it, the main focus will have to be to uh, kind of ease these children back to school and be very, you know, very kind of, the, the kind of training have to be very adaptive or very according to the, the needs of the children. Um, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's what I think is the most, uh, most important. And uh, of course, the whole question of uh, of you know keeping physical distance, uh, handling Corona. But uh, I mean, the children I've seen coming back to this. You know, we already started having uh, sent uh, what you call it groups of six to nine children uh, meeting in the villages with physical distance, and they uh, either they come with their masks or they are given masks when they come. And children are incredibly adaptive. They just are so happy to be back to learning. So, uh, so I think the main support you can give these kids is to enable enable them to get back to learning. Uh, it's I mean it's amazing to see how they how they adapt. I mean the ch children don't have problem of sitting apart and you know following the rules. They 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 are, they do that, but they need a teacher who understands them and can support them. So I think the main thing is that, yes, teachers have to, you know, they have to see themselves not only as teachers who provide academic knowledge, but they also have to create a safe environment and a, a classroom that is 
inclusive. Um, and that, I think that's the most important because I can't really see, you know, teachers in, in our setting giving one-to-one -one counseling or, or things like that, which of course also be ideal, but it's very difficult to achieve in the kind of, you know, workload they have and so on. But I think this of creating just a very, very inclusive classroom to kind of invite, uh, welcome every child back, make sure that they feel safe, that they follow the, the you know, everybody follow very strictly the, the hy hygiene and safety rules. I think that's the best kind of environment you can, you can create for welcoming the children back to school. I hope that answered the question or at least some of it. <laughs> Oh, I think I think you have. Um, Avinash, I see that you you are ready to jump in there. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So of course, like the 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 main problem would be like uh, this dropout thing, but like dropout could be of due to so so many other other reasons also because like childrens are now getting adapted to a different kind of like their lifestyle. Like even like us, like we are getting getting adapted to this kind of lifestyle. So. Once the, we start going to office regularly, we might not feel that comfortable like we used to do that before. So even and that the same thing might apply to children so that they might not feel motivated. And then other things li are like uh, like normally in case of like developing countries like uh, and, and children who are in rural areas, their parents might lose the job, uh, might lose the job. And, and there are so many other other uh, things they they might lose other economic opportunities things. So that's why they also will not uh, will, will not return to school so the, the we also need to like basically identify those things and then also one other thing that we need to uh, we need to be very careful is like even uh, as children they have not like made made their friends or any anyone for like last many months even some children they might feel like uh, so, for example let's say a children a she was she was very comfortable talking to her talking to the friends in the school like six months back, but now when she returned return to school, she might not uh, be so friendly talking to her friends. So she might uh, like might not feel safe and connected to others. So even that time, the teachers should uh, take responsibility of how to make them feel safe and connected to everyone. So those kind of like psychological support also we, we need to provide. Uh, so I don't know, like I talked upon the question exactly or not, but like these things I, I, would, I would just like to add, add on that thank you thank you thank you go ahead Caroline <laughs> thank you no I think key point yes loss of learning where we you know we know from the World Bank study but in fact one of our you know colleagues one of our chiefs today was talking about a grade two, two teacher saying well actually I'm not a grade two teacher I'm a grade one teacher because you know the children missed out so much of grade one they've gone into grade two and basically she's having to start all over again and that's a very big issue for younger children it's challenging enough for older children who perhaps could do remote learning more effectively etc but for younger children that haven't yet learned how to learn as well so it's not just you know it's not loss of content it's learning how to learn and as our you know colleague said it's learning how to interact and how to engage that kind of social development within the classroom you know they, they haven't learned that or they've forgotten that and they can't quite do it as we want them to do it because they have to keep social distancing and they have to wear masks so you know we can't go kind of fully into getting them in working in groups and getting them this and this there's this whole new world so i think these are the challenges you know the social development the learning the loss of learning but also the loss of learning how to learn and there has to be a lot of support i think one of the things is empower the children you know like in terms of the coronavirus to really understand it and to understand what they can do at their own level not to be frightened, not to overwhelm them with facts and information, but to empower them, you know, and to get them to do things, positive things and make posters, et cetera. So at least that at the core, they can feel safe and they can feel empowered. And I think that's something that we've been doing, you know, working with the children, having a kind of competition in terms of messages, in terms of posters, having little videos of you know other children doing something in their school. So I think that's very, very important. A lot of emphasis on that and a lot of emphasis really on some games, within the classroom, whatever is possible, thinking, don't forget the PE, you know, it's, everything is possible, you just need a bit of imagination, <laughs> you can do everything. So I think that as well, and, and just going slowly, and 
think for, you know, not, I wouldn't be focusing on, you know, the page 20 that I must cover if I was a teacher. I would be focusing on getting the children back together and learning how to learn and learning how to be together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I kind of want, I want to come back to this question that I raised earlier about um, equity issues and something that we've been noticing around the world. And I, I was stuck in the United States for a few months and even noticed it there is the fact that the global shutdown of education systems and schools has really had an impact on exasperating the inequalities and equities that are already there. And what do you see that we can do as educators who are already working with extremely marginalized groups of children, children who are already out of school, were already out of school and have, have lost out on learning, don't have the resources that you know others may have to get private tutors or to keep their learning going during this period. What can we do to try and keep that inequality or inequity gap from getting even larger? Yeah, I think. Uh, Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. Okay, I. Yeah, I. I. It's very clear, you know. It's it's. Uh, sometimes it's very bizarre when you watch TV and then the people are talking about the problems. You know, the children are, are on computer the whole day, and then they, you know, they need connection with the teacher and different kind of things. And and then you know that the majority of children that we work with. You know, yes, 30% have had access to a smartphone when the parents were forced to stay at home. But immediately when they were able to go back to work, then they had no phones. So, you know, that's another thing. Yes, it was great with the WhatsApp and, and also astonishing how fast the children adopted to WhatsApp and, and phone messages uh, while they could. But then, unfortunately, it didn't last that long. So, um, but I think... I mean, as a you know, overall picture, be it COVID or not, I think a, a kind of my burning issue is that we need to ensure children to have the foundations in order. It was mentioned here, you know, they need to learn how to learn. And uh, that's why we have to invest much more or put a lot of effort in ensuring that children learn during yeah, already preschool, but then, you know, in the first five years of, of school, uh, so that they, uh, when they, you can say, have a complete grade five, they are, they are confident readers, they can write, they can do simple mathematics, because that is the foundation for continuing to learn. And um, if, if, if we want to kind of create a new generation that will not follow the footsteps of their illiterate parents who are underpaid and dependent on daily wages or, or poor, you know, poor farmers, then, uh, then their children need to be given this education. And I think that's what Educated Child uh, does as a program is to get all these, you know, the many children that are out of school. We are working both with the out of school children but also addressing the children in school who may sit in the classroom but simply don't learn because the teacher is teaching on curriculum level and the children are far below curriculum level. So to, um, when it comes to policies, when it comes to methodologies, we need to adapt to methodologies that enable every child to learn at the level they are and, uh, and, you know, and use things as peer learning and different kind of methodologies, workbooks, worksheets, so enabled so that a teacher who has children on many different uh, levels has tools to be able to provide that kind of facilitate that kind of learning. And I think that's the, that is the main challenge. Um, of course, you can talk about inequities all the way up to university level, but, but I would kind of, I think we have to, if, if children lose out on the first primary education, then they will lose out forever. They will stay, I mean, it's very difficult for children without education who doesn't have the capacity to learn to get out of poverty.
Go ahead, Avinash. I see you've unmuted. Sorry, Caroline. He beat you to it. So I think like of uh, this scenario is going to increase the learning, like uh, learning uh, equity. So in low and income countries uh, like Nepal, like there, there was already a huge socioeconomic gap between the rich and the poor people. Uh, even the quality education is still a dream for many rural and marginalized children. Uh, in the, uh, and with this, like uh, with this, uh, with the advent, advent of this, like digital learning platforms and availability of resources, uh, I think this will further increase the inequality between the high and low income people. And you, like uh, the educated and wealthy family will be able to cope up with the all the challenges faced due to the pandemic because like they have uh, computers and smartphone, tablets, internet, uh, so many materials available. However, like uh, like none of these available for the poor family. And uh, even like when the and, and because of this, like when the school restarts, really poor and uh, like other people, children who lives in the rural community, they they will they, they might find like themselves even further behind their peers because of uh, they didn't get this opportunity in the time of the pandemic. So basically, I think this might again going to increase uh, uh, this digital learning might going to widen the inequality gap and then leaving a huge number of students behind. So yeah, that could be one thing. Thank you, Caroline. I know you want to jump in and um, thank you. Take, no, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No, I just think that, you know, first of all, we want to know what the inequity is. So it comes back to the monitoring evaluation, you know, and why it is. And we found out through our monitoring evaluation and that we knew anyway about, you know, how many children did not have access or had very reduced access. But the one thing is stop using, you know, models that a lot of children haven't got access to. And we learned that. And we learned that. So, and we're not, you know, we've already got a couple of our fields have gone back to school, but most of them are on remote learning now, or they've closed again in Gaza. The schools haven't opened in Jordan, they opened and they closed in Lebanon, they didn't open yet. So, we're going to be in remote learning, we're going to be in hybrid models, etc. So, one thing is, don't, you know, don't continue to do something which is actually causing inequity or widening, you know, the gap between those that can and those who can't. And that's, you know, changing, going down low tech. You know, if the higher tech is not working, go low tech, go back to paper, go back to the textbook, go back to printing. And the other thing with regard to, I think, being in the school is don't be, you know, I think it's prioritizing what we said earlier, prioritizing the children, being back, prioritizing the kind of learning to learn and the social development mm -hmm. and not immediately all panicking and we must get through this, and we must get through that because that will leave many children behind. And then it has to be everything that we know about in terms of, knowing where the children are and trying and this is where i go back to our teacher training trying to have a differentiated approach in the classroom so you're not just teaching to kind of the middle you know 20 you're teaching all of them and you do whatever you can and we have large classes and we have 50 kids in our classes and our children are palestine refugees so we're not talking about you know privileged children at all here so i think it has to be finding out what's causing the inequity and doing what you can about it continuing to monitor and evaluate what's happening yeah. And then being really aware in terms of the children that might drop out if you go back to the school and have the systems in place in terms of doing what you can to stop, whether it's talking to the parents and our Palestine refugee teachers, you know, are part of the community. Like I think our colleagues, the teachers are also So perhaps, you know, trying to, to stop it, to get in at certain stages. So I think it's many different approaches and we, and we have to make sure that all of them and maybe I think there was so much emphasis on the kind of online you know, you hear the whole world talking about online. And yeah, actually, I've got this map on my um, laptop, my screensaver, of who really went online in the world. <laughs> and it's very interesting. They've got different colours. And it's actually, it's like Iceland or something, you know, and Australia <laughs> really went online. And the rest of us, you know, including my own country, there was all sorts of challenges. No way could this be a wonderful classroom, you know, maybe in a private school, etc. So I think that as as countries, as you know, ministries, as UN agencies, we should stop panicking about, you know, as if it's competitive, we must get online. We must do what's best for the children. And as I said, we are going to continue to do this. It's the children that matter, not the technology. So I think it's, you know, just getting all those things right with regard to, you know, a avoiding such inequities. And the most important thing I was going to say, sorry, at the last, is measure it. You know, I mean, have targets whereby you're measuring 
the difference between the children's performance. And we have such a target actually in UNRWA. Right? We do an assessment every three years and we measure the gap and we set the target of basically we want more children to go up. You know, we, and we obviously we don't want to bring these children down. These children are doing all right, but we want more children. So I think we have to measure inequity and move away from measuring mean scores only. And I think that's so it's a very kind of coherent approach, I think, to inequity. Thank you. Well, I think you just summed up everything for me. Um, we are at time. I want to thank you all for your participation, your insights, the work that you're doing. I want to thank the attendees, the participants um, that have sat in and listened to us today and asked questions for their time as well and their interest in this topic. Um, I will do a brief summary. It may take us over just a tiny bit, but before I do that, if you, I'm going to just ask each of you to, if you could just give us one or two takeaways at most, very short, like less than, I don't know, 10 words, but the two very short, one or two takeaways that you would want us to leave today with. Go ahead and unmute and just jump in. I, what can we say? I say, I tell you two things, put the children first, you know, forget the technology, forget this, put the children and their learning first. And the second is, all in it together let's all learn and let's really reflect and then let's see what that means in terms of what we should do yeah i think it's uh, since the topic is the role of the teachers so uh you know to continue to provide support to teachers provide training um facilitate that they keep on learning from each other uh, as was mentioned by one of the participants so i think yes and, uh, and 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 give the teachers tools to be able to keep the children learning no matter what and i agree not it can, online or not online it's the teach uh, the children's actual situation that counts uh my two things could be like one thing could be like don't do like what other side others are doing so basically do what is like suitable for your situation for your particular thing so try to do that don't copy uh, like uh, the bigger things and then second thing could be like take care of as this is a teachers things uh, we are talking about the day the, 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 and we all we just celebrated teachers they also so take care of your teachers so that like they will take care of the children so yeah these are the two things i think those are excellent points that to end on i would i would also, I think like to point out the fact that while we didn't say it specifically, every single one of you touched on the importance of making teachers feel like they are part of a profession that is highly recognized and valued, that has a progression through it, and that they're supported. And if we do that and provide them with the teaching that allows them to learn how to learn, our children will then learn how to learn. And, um, you know, the differentiated learning approaches don't only help the children out, but they also help the teacher because they're, they're becoming uh, more effective in their jobs and seeing better growth from their students. And the reward of seeing their children actually learning and progressing, hopefully, you know, is a motivation, right? Um, I think we could continue this conversation for hours, if not days. Um, and maybe we will have an opportunity to do so in the future. Um, but I do want to once again thank each and every one of you for having participated, for sharing your experience, your knowledge, your insights, and for the work that you're doing in the field and for being partners with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to my colleagues. Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you. And thank you to our participants who we can't see. We only hope they're out there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay.